anti-gravity, the holy grail of transportation and the moving of heavy masses. An elusive force or effect referenced in both fiction as well as in the real world. But what could we theorize about the nature and properties of anti-gravity? Anti-gravity as envisioned in popular media, at least when it pertains to some type of transportation, essentially mimics all of the features of maglev or electrodynamic suspension, but without the limitations of only being able to operate over metallic surfaces. For instance, we can see here that the hoverboard of the movie Back to the Future 2 practically has identical motion characteristics to Eric Lathwaite's magnetic levitation concept, which he called the magnetic river. In fact, the producers of the Back to the Future franchise explained that the hoverboard concept was partially inspired by the work of engineers at Cornell University who were experimenting with maglev train technology at the time. These engineers would most certainly have learned of the work of Lathwaite, also known by some as the father of maglev, during their research. The in-universe explanation for the hoverboard's levitation system is described as simply maglev, though it is not, it is not explained how it could operate over non-metallic surfaces. The real-world explanation for this, of course, is that the levitation concept itself was simply expand, expanded to make it significantly more versatile using movie magic. This rendered the conceptualized device able to hover over practically any surface, including water. Up, upgrading the hoverboard concept from maglev to gravlev, or anti-gravity. But would real-world anti-gravity operate in the same manner as its sci-fi counterpart? Or would its properties exert effects perhaps we haven't yet even thought of? What would be the nature of the materials and mechanisms needed to achieve gravitational effects? And how might it fit in with Albert Einstein's theories and modern quantum science? In this video, we will explore likely answers to these questions, as well as consider how maglev might assist us in the understanding of true anti-gravity. Since anti-gravity isn't really acknowledged as a valid principle by mainstream science, the term itself is only loosely defined and is without an official scientific definition or universal description. Modern science does, however, recognize a repulsive gravitational force, at least on an astronomical scale, which we will, we will discuss shortly. But it does not refer to this force as anti-gravity. This is likely because traditional academia tends to disassociate itself from terms that are historically classified only as pseudoscience or crackpot theories. Another example of this tendency is the recent achievement of nuclear fusion using lasers. Though the energy release was significantly greater than the input energy of the lasers, modern science does not refer to this gain as overunity energy, another term traditionally associated with fringe science. But even still, we could recognize the basic concepts, whether in the realm of fringe or not. One school of thought imagines anti-gravity is a force which cancels the force of gravity over an object, resulting in the object either floating in a fixed position in mid-air, no matter how massive, or rendered so light that it can be easily lifted. The degree of cancellation may vary from canceling only a percentage of apparent weight or canceling it completely. This type of anti-gravity may in some cases extend from one object to even a fixed area such that any object within that region would either lose weight or even float. Still, another concept would be a complete reversion of gravity in which an object, rather than accelerating towards Earth, would move away from the Earth, in effect falling away from the Earth's surface. As the object moves out of the gravitational field of the planet, it's a question of whether or not it would decelerate away from the Earth in the same way that a normal object would accelerate. In this case, we may further specify it as negative gravity, since such a condition would cause the object to fall away from the Earth rather than towards it. To gain further insight into the concept of gravity, 
we can look at Einstein's equivalence principle. This principle is allow, allows gravity to be practically replicated in space by accelerating a room with rockets at a magnitude of 9.8 meters per second squared. This would produce a force or effect indistinguishable from gravity on Earth. Thus, the equivalence principle of anti-gravity would be produced by slowing the room down by gradually shutting off the rockets. We would then be in a free fall condition, which would result in us floating just above the surface of the room. This will be equivalent to anti-gravity and something akin to Luke Skywalker's land speeder or Marty McFly's hoverboard and indistinguishable for, from as astronauts floating around in the space capsule. Negative gravity then would be achieved by reversing the rockets and accelerating the room in the opposite direction. Our heads would then be in gravitational contact with what to us would be the ceiling, and so we would have to turn ourselves 180 degrees around to a new, a new orientation to be right side up. This would be negative gravity, at least to us on the rocket. If accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared, this would be negative 1g. Earth's rotation also produces a type of pseudo antigravity via centrifugal force. Gravity in this case functions as the antagonistic centripetal force, which keeps us from flying off of the planet. This effect is strongest at the equator where the ground speed is 1,000 miles per hour. An object at the equator weighs about 0.4% less than it would at the poles. Additionally, the Earth's spin also causes the center of the planet to bulge, so that at the equator, the object is about 13 miles further from the Earth's center of gravity, and thus weighs an additional 0.1% less, for a total of 0.5% less weight at the equator than at the poles. If the ground speed were increased to 16,000 miles per hour, neglecting for an increase in the accompanying bulge, then loose objects will hover above the Earth's surface in what we would term low Earth orbit. The space station, by contrast, travels at about 17,400 miles per hour in order to stay in orbit around the planet. If the ground speed were increased even further, then we could surmise that the centrifugal force would overwhelm the centripetal force of gravity and would be propelled from the Earth altogether. The objects would appear to fall away from the Earth, an effect we would also describe as negative gravity. So it seems that the equi equivalence principle for gravity could be extended to include conditions of motion, which reflect the equivalence principle for anti-gravity and negative gravity as well. Now that we have some idea of what we would want out of anti-gravity, let's backtrack and review exactly what gravity is according to classical and quantum physics to see if anything like anti-gravity could be derived or generated in the real world. As it says here, gravity as defined by modern science is a fundamental, fundamental interaction which causes mutual attraction between all objects which have mass. It is by far the weakest of the four fundamental interactions being approximately 10 to the 38th times or 38 orders of magnitude weaker than the strong nuclear force, 36 orders weaker than the electromagnetic force, and 29 orders weaker in magnitude than the weak nuclear force. Because of this relative weakness, it is pra has practically no influence at the level of subatomic particles. However, for objects at the macroscopic scale, it is practically ubiquitous and determines the motions of planets, stars, galaxies, and even has an effect on the behavior of light. Gravitation itself is the mutual attraction between all masses in the universe, also known as gravitational attraction. Gravity is the gravitational attraction of all uh, at the surface of a planet or other celestial body. Thus far as only been most accurately described by the general theory of relativity proposed by Albert Einstein in 1915. Einstein's theory of relativity classifies gravity not, only, not really as a force, 
but as the curvature of space-time and is simultaneously indistinguishable from acceleration at a value of 9.8 meters per second squared. This is known as the previously mentioned equivalence principle. The principle essentially says that at this value, inertial mass due to acceleration is equal to gravitational mass due to the mutual attraction between masses. As one of the fundamental four fundamental forces of the universe, gravity is quite unique. The, the other three fundamental forces of nature, the electromagnetic interaction, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force can all be described within the framework of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. Gravity at present is the only interaction that has not been fully accommodated into the quantum framework. General relativity has been very successful at predicting the effects of, of gravity on large scales. However, it is ultimately incompatible with quantum mechanics. This is because general relativity describes gravity as a smooth, continuous distortion of space-time, while quantum mechanics holds that all forces arise from the, extreme, the exchange of discrete particles known as quanta. The photon is the mediator of electromagnetism, for instance. The gluon is the mediator for the strong nuclear force, and the W and Z bosons mediate the weak nuclear force. All three of these forces appear to be accurately de described by the standard model of particle physics. The graviton, if it exists, would be the force carrier for gravity and would allow for a theory of quantum gravity. The graviton is expected to be massless because the gravitational force has a very long range and appears to propagate at the speed of light. Light exists as discrete quanta called, called photons, which propagate in a wave-like pattern. Does gravity possess similar properties? Gravity waves have indeed been detected. But are there discrete gravitational particles called gravitons, which also move in a wave-like pattern just as photons do? And even if so, would we be able to harness the gravitational force that they transmit? String theory predicts the existence of gravitons and their well-defined interactions. In physics, string theory is a theoretical framework in which the point-like particles of particle physics are replaced by one-dimensional strings. String theory describes how the strings propagate through space and interact with each other. It says here that, on distant scales larger than the string scale, a string looks just like an ordinary particle, with its mass, charge, and other properties determined by the vibrational state of the string. In string theory, one of the many vibrational states of the string correspond to the graviton, a quantum mechanical particle that carries gravitational force. Thus, string theory is essentially a theory of quantum gravity. The hypothetical graviton is actually how the Star Trek universe describes gravity and also how it allows the technology of that universe to generate artificial gravity without need for acceleration or for a centrifugal force. Instead, gravity plates line the inside of ships and sh shuttlecraft and generate gravitons which in turn can produce gravitational fields that are indistinguishable from that of Earth or any Earth-like planet. The gravity fields can also be switched off, allowing a person to float around the ship. It is essentially gravity at the flip of a switch, in the same way that electromagnetism of electromagnet can be switched on and off. With the same, within the same universe, the graviton has an antithesis called the antigraviton. By generating antigravitons, Star Trek engineers can create antigravity to lift, repel, and propel objects, as well as to generate force fields. But even if the graviton is found to exist, there might be a question as if uh, with whether or not graviton technology could exert practical forces anywhere near those the strength of electromagnetism as gravity is so much, so many orders weaker than the former, as previously stated. 
36 orders of magnitude weaker, in fact. Would this mean that we would need 36 orders of magnitude more energy to exert, exert a force of gravitation of the same strength as that of electromagnetism? Are there any hints of naturally occurring anti-gravity in the universe? If gravity is so weak in comparison to the other forces, perhaps we would only be able to observe it at the level of lar the largest stars. Also, what would be the gravitational equivalent of a magnet? A magnet, as we know, exert, it exerts a continuous magnetic force without any input of energy, at least in the classical sense. Depending on the orientation of the magnet, it will attract or repel another magnet. Magnets exert attractive forces on ferromagnetic and paramagnetic materials and repulsive forces on diamagnetic materials. But if we vibrate, rotate, or oscillate the magnet in such ways that its magnetic field becomes time varying, then eddy currents can be generated within any nearby non-ferrous metals, such as copper or aluminum, which will be equal and opposite to the varying field. This principle is known as Lenz's Law, and it's the principle by which electrodynamic suspension, a form of repulsive magnetic levitation, or maglev, works. And so the question is, does maglev have a gravitational counterpart? Would it be possible to devise a similar process which generates gravitational eddy currents within all matter, enabling the creation of a device which could levitate just like a maglev device, but which could do so over any surface regardless of composition? For this, we must first attempt to answer the above question of what is the gravitational equivalent of a magnet? It would really just be any object with mass. We could call them graph nets, and we would essentially classify all masses in this manner, though the very densest objects would be the best. As with magnets, graph nets would not require any external energy input. We can also see the similarities in Newton's uh, equations for gravitational attraction between two objects and the magnetic attraction between two magnets. The formula is also similar to the attraction between electrical charges. An experiment known as the Cavendish experiment shown in the figure here demonstrates this principle and is somewhat similar to a setup demonstrating the magnetic attraction between magnets, or better yet, the electrical attraction between dissimilar charges. Isaac Newton's law of universal gravitation proposed that the gravitational attraction between any two objects is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. In equation form, this is often expressed as follows, where the constant of proportionality in the equation is g. This is the universal gravitational constant. The value of g was not experimentally determined until nearly a century later in 1798 by Lord Henry Cavendish using a torsion balance. Cavendish's apparatus for experimentally determining the value of G involved a light rigid rod about two feet long. Two small lead spheres were attached to the ends of the rod and the rod was suspended by a thin wire. When the rod became twisted, the torsion of the wire begins to exert a torsional force that is proportional to the angle of the rod, rotation of the rod. The more twist of the wire, the more the system pushes backwards to restore itself towards the original position. Cavendish had calibrated his instrument to determine the relationship between the angle of rotation and the amount of torsional force. Cavendish then brought two large spheres near the smaller spheres that were attached to the rod. And since all masses attract, the large spheres and smaller spheres attracted each other gravitationally and twisted the rod by a measurable amount. Once the torsional force balanced the gravitational force, the rod and spheres came to rest, and Cavendish was able to determine the gravitational force of attraction between the masses. By measuring the mass 1, mass 2, the distance, and the force of gravity, 
the value of G could be determined. Cavendish's measurements resulted in the experimentally determined value of 6.75 times 10 to the 11th Newton meters squared divided by a kilogram squared. Today, the currently accepted value uh, yields the same order of magnitude in units, but with a base value of 6.67259 instead of 6.75. The following video is a reproduction of Cavendish's experiment. We can see empirically that the resulting gravitational force between even large heavy balls is quite weak in comparison to even medium strength magnets. The best gravitation then would actually be a piece of white dwarf star matter or even a neutron star. A white dwarf is formed when a low mass star has exhausted all of its central nuclear fuel and loses its outer layers. Having a density of 10 to the 9th kilograms per cubic meter, one mere teaspoon of white dwarf material would weigh in at about 5.5 tons on Earth, though other sources place this amount at a weight of about 100 tons. Unbelievably, a neutron star would be unfathomably heavier. A neutron star is a super dense collapsed core of a massive star that exploded as a supernova. With a density of 10 to the 17 kilograms uh, per cubic meter, one teaspoon of a neutron star would weigh an astonishing 10 million tons, almost 2 million times that of the same amount of white dwarf material. It is incredible that so much mass could be packed into such small spaces. Imagine conducting the Cavendish experiment with these masses. Using the formula for gravitational attraction between two masses, we can get an idea of the forces utilized uh, utilizing star matter. Looking at the mathematical work here, we can see that a piece of white dwarf star matter the size of a bowling ball and one the size of a golf ball would experience a gravitational attraction of 3.3 pounds if they were one meter apart. This force increases to a colossal 33,300 pounds if they were 100 times closer at one centimeter. But this estimate is only for one pair of white dwarf of a white dwarf bowling ball and golf ball. For a Cavendish experiment, we would need another pair in order to obtain a similar setup. This would double the force for a value of 6.7 pounds at one meter separation and 66 point or 66.6 thousand pounds or 33.3 tons at one centimeter separation. Performing the same experiment with the neutron star matter, again, one size of the typical bowling ball and one size of a golf ball would yield an unfathomable 33.3 million billion pounds of gravitational attractive force between the two at a separation of one meter. So two sets double this force at 66.6 .6 million billion pounds or 33.3 .3 million million tons. In fact, the gravitons in the experiment would smash into contact with each other and re remain in contact just as two super strong magnets, but via gravitational attraction rather than magnetic attraction. With such astronomical forces involved, such experiments with these gravnets would be far too dangerous to carry out here on Earth. We should assume that we would most certainly have to carry this experiment uh, out in space, far from Earth, and likely even the solar system. But actually, even a small amount of such compact material would likely explode if removed from the immense gravitational field of the rest of the collapsed star, as it is the tremendous gravity that allows it to remain so compact and dense. But we can't conveniently ignore this principle for the sake of the thought experiment. But we would most certainly see a revolution in science 
we were able to conduct gravitational experiments in the vicinity of these remarkable star materials. With this amount of supermass packed into such a small space, we should not only be able to observe super strong gravitational interactions, but also to finally detect gravitons. We know that the density of electrons is proportional to the strength of the electric field, and likely super strong gravitational field of star matter should be proportional to the density of gravitons. So many gravitons packed into such small spaces should be much easier to detect. During such experiments, perhaps we would also detect antigravitons as well if they, if they in fact exist. But let's speculate even further. Let's imagine that we could eliminate any danger and physical limitations of handling such materials. What will happen then if we vibrated, oscillated, or rotated such materials? Will we be able to generate gravitational eddy currents in the surrounding masses, just as time-varying magnetic fields generate electrical eddy currents? We do know that super-dense masses spinning, oscillating, or quivering do in fact generate gravitational waves and eddies, ripples through the fabric of space and time, and that these waves travel at the speed of light. And so would this bring into play a gravitational equivalent of Lenz's law? with those gravitational eddies being equal and opposite to the source changing gravitational field, allowing us to repel and levitate an object via gravitational levitation or gravitational suspension? Even if so, the opposing gravitational reaction will have to be incredibly strong to overcome the sheer weight of the gravinets themselves. But again, such experiments would be incredibly challenging to carry out the more feasible but still incredibly difficult attempt to generate gravitational levitation or anti-gravity would be to use energy. This fits in with a statement here, which says that energy modifies the shape of space-time itself, and that gravity is the result of this shape. We know that mass and energy are equivalent via Einstein's E equals, e equals mc squared. Thus, energy can have the same effect on the fabric of time and space as mass does as they are fundamentally the same. But a prodigious amount of energy is needed to equal even a small amount of mass because of the huge proportionality constant of C squared. As an example, it would take a colossal 9 times 10 to the 16th or 90,000 trillion joules of energy to equal only one kilogram of mass according to the equation E equals MC squared. It seems nearly impossible, but would still be comparatively more practical than handling the super dense masses from white dwarfs or neutron stars. As an interesting side note, this star matter scenario is mirrored in a Wikipedia article on the fictional repulsor lift technology of Star Wars. Repulsor lift engines are what allow vehicles within that universe to levitate and hover above a planet's surface. The effect was said to be made possible via subnuclear knots in the fabric of space-time. These knots were manufactured by automated refineries erected around black holes. So this sounds very much like our off-world Cavendish experiment with gravnets mentioned just a few minutes ago. And so with all this impracticality in attempting to achieve the anti-gravity of science fiction, perhaps we need to redefine anti-gravity for the real world. Are there ways around the need for such enormous amounts of mass or energy to create gravitational effects? And are any of these ways connected at all to electromagnetism or other forces? For these questions, let's look at the claims of two gravity researchers by the names of Dr. Ning Li and Eugene Poklinov. Dr. Ning Li was an American scientist known for her controversial anti-gravity research. In a series of papers, co-authored with fellow university physicist Douglas Tor, and published between 1991 and 93, she claimed a practical way to produce anti-gravity effects using rotating ions. These ions allegedly created a gravi gravitomagnetic field perpendicular to the spin axis. 
According to her theory, if a large number of ions could be aligned, the resulting effect would be a very strong gravitomagnetic field producing a strong, strong repulsive force. And so here the anti-gravity that Dr. Ning Li describes was more of an active repulsive force, something akin to the Star Wars repulsor lift. It further says here that the alignment of ions may be possible by trapping them in a lattice structure in a high temperature superconducting disk. Dr. Ning Li claimed the experimental results confirmed her theories. In 1997, she published, published a paper saying, uh, uh, reporting anomalous weight changes of between 0.05 to 2.1% for a test mass that was suspended above a rotating superconductor. Another article here says that in a high temperature superconducting disk, the tiny gra gravitational effect of each individual item is multiplied by the billions of items within the disk. Using about one kilowatt of electricity, Dr. Ning Li claimed that her device could produce a force field that would effectively neutralize gravity above one foot in diameter uh, region extending from the surface of the planet into outer space. Now, if these claims are true, then perhaps this avenue would be much more practical as Dr. Ning Li was apparently able to achieve measurable gravitational effects using a mere kilowatt of electricity. Also worthy of mention is that this version of her anti-gravity research is describing a type of gravitational shielding as opposed to the just mentioned repulsive gravitational force. In other words, she seems to be describing two different types of anti-gravity or gravity control. The article continues saying that to demonstrate their research, Dr. Ning Li and her team invited officials from the renowned science and technology magazine, Popular Mechanics, to visit their laboratory in Huntsville to see their work in progress. This consisted of a 12 inch disc, which acted as a high temperature superconductor. Upon the disc completion, they told the magazine, a bowling ball placed anywhere above the disc will stay exactly where you left it. So again, this seems to be gravitational shielding, which would neutralize gravity. This seems to be why the bowling ball would be stable in this position, as repulsive forces by contrast are usually inherently unstable and require additional elements of stability. In the late 90s, she claimed to have created anti-gravity devices that were fully functional, and this was big news in both scientific journals as well as the mainstream press. In 1997, Dr. Ning Li continued to expand on her concept and conduct more experiments. She published papers describing the anomalous weight changes in objects suspended over a rotating superconductor. We might know here Note here the association of rotation and gravitational effects, and can see shades of Otis T. Carr, John Searle, and Victor Schauberger. All three made similar claims. In 1999, Dr. Ning Lee left the University of Alabama in Huntsville, where she worked as a research scientist at the Center for Space Plasma and Aer Aeronomic Research. She formed her own company, which she named AC Gravity LLC, and apparently received funding in the amount of nearly half a million dollars from the Department of Defense in 2001 to continue her anti-gravity research. No evidence exists that the company performed any other work, although as of 2021, AC Gravity still remains listed as a viable business. And so the question is, has there been any other contemporary researchers who have made similar claims and used similar materials? Well, at least one researcher goes by the name of Eugene Potkinov, and it's probably more a rec uh, more recognizable name in the field of modern anti-gravity research using superconductors. In 1992, Eugene Potkinov and his team at the Tampere Institute of Technology in Finland tested the uniformity of 
a unique bulky superconducting disc, which rotated at a speed of about 5,000 RPM via a magnetic field. According to the account Pogunov gave during a 1996 phone interview, during a 1992 experiment with a rotating superconducting disc, someone in the laboratory was smoking a pipe and the pipe smoke rose in a column above the superconducting disc. So we placed a bell-shaped magnet above the disc attached to the balance. The balance behaved strangely. We then substituted a non-magnetic material, silicon, and still the balance was very strange. We found that any object above the disc lost some of its weight, and we found that if we rotated the disc, the effect was increased. This is similar in one thing of Dr. Ning Li's research, and it's descriptive of gravity shielding rather than any type of attractive or repulsive gravitational force. Potglitnov insisted that his gravity shielding was re reproduced by researchers at universities in Toronto and in Sheffield, but none have come forward to acknowledge this. He is also said to have advised others performing similar experiments, but apparently none have been successful. Poklitnov has allegedly been approached by Boeing to set up experiments to validate his claims. However, being strongly anti-military, he is said to be committed to proving uh, to pro providing assistance if the research is carried out in the white world of open development and progress. Poklinov knew of Dr. Ning Li and her work and was contacted when the paper trail of her activities stopped. Apparently, he possessed some insider's knowledge on Dr. Ning Li's whereabouts and confirmed her well-being. But she was said to have been working for the Department of Defense at the time and could not talk about what she was doing. So these are two very fascinating accounts. And if true, then it definitely confirms two different types of anti-gravity or gravity control, namely gravitational shielding as well as gravitational repulsion. The latter principle is particularly interesting because when you think of gravitation, we traditionally think of an attractive force. If gravitational repulsion is possible, then perhaps it would be more conceivable with gravitons if we could generate them in large enough densities. We can imagine the interaction of particles which will be attracted to or repelled from each other, just as with protons and electrons. But what about gravitational repulsion in a relativistic sense? Well, actually, even mainstream science has contemplated the possibility of repulsive gravity for quite some time, as Einstein's equations do actually allow for it. The general idea is that the universe is filled with a uniform bath or field of energy, dark energy to be exact. This uniform bath is called the inflaton field. Investigators of past eras, such as Nikola Tesla and John Worrell Keeley, referred to this bath or field as the ether, while modern alternative theorists refer to it as uh, vacuum energy or zero-point energy. In contrast to the super-dense, compact masses of planets, or the previously discussed neutron stars, which give rise to positive or attractive gravity, it is theorized that a uniform region of energy will give rise to negative or repulsive gravity. It says here that the possibility of repulsive gravity arises because, according to Einstein's theory of general relativity, gravitational fields are produced not just by energy or mass densities, but also by pressures. Pressures like energy densities create gravitational fields, and in particular, a positive pressure creates an attractive gravitational field. The negative pressure of the vacuum, therefore, creates a repulsive gravitational field, which is the driving force behind inflation. To un understand this further, we need to turn to the Big Bang Theory, where it is said that all of the composition of the unimaginably immense universe was initially 
uh, smaller than the head of a pen, sometimes recur referred to as the Big Crunch. Within this tiny region was a uniform energy bath. The resulting repulsive gravity caused the rapid expansion of, expansion of this region, resulting in the universe as we see it today. Now we know that the universe is still expanding, but intuition would tell us that this expansion should be slowing down due to the collective gravitational attraction of all the mass within the universe. However, in 2011, the opposite was found to be true, as it was revealed that the universe's expansion is not slowing down, but it's actually speeding up at an increased rate. In other words, the expansion is accelerating. So what we have then is another equivalence principle involving inertial gravity, negative or repulsive gravity, or specifically. We've seen earlier that the equivalence principle equates gravitational mass to inertial mass. And so the question is, is this negative or repulsive gravity also related to negative inertial mass or negative mass in general? Negative mass is a hypothetical counterpart to what we know as ordinary mass, which is defaulted as positive. The basic concept of negative mass arises from an analogy with negative and positive charges. Different motions and even energetic screening can occur due to the polarized nature of electrical charges. And so these properties of screening and motion due to polarization could theoretically extend to mass and inertia as well. The article here describes the hypothetical inertial properties of negative mass by imagining a spacecraft in space far away from any massive gravitational bodies. Under these conditions, the mass of the spacecraft would manifest itself as inertia. In other words, as resistance to any change in, in its motion. The more massive it is, the bigger the force needed to accelerate it or deflect it from its course. Ordinary mass moves in the direction that it is pushed with an acceleration proportional to the pushing force as given by Newton's equation, force equals mass times acceleration. Negative mass, by contrast, would presumably be moved towards a pushing force and away from a pulling force, with accelerations proportional to the size of these forces. The article goes on to muse that we've always experienced gravity as an attractive pulling force in its interaction with ordinary matter. Wouldn't the reverse be true in the case of negative mass? It says that one might suppose that if a negative mass were placed near the Earth's surface, it would move away from the latter's gravitational pull and effectively fall upward. It goes on to say that since we don't currently have any objects of negative mass to experiment with, we don't know for sure if this would happen. However, if such objects were observed to fall upward instead, then we have to suppose that positive and negative masses have either the same inertial properties or the same gravitational property properties, but not both. For example, we might assume that the gravitational force between two masses is proportional only to the numerical magnitude of their product, regardless of whether this product is negative or positive. Then a negative mass would be attracted by Earth's gravity, but because of its inertial perversity, would respond to this attraction by falling upward. In other words, as mentioned in the spacecraft inertial example mentioned earlier, the mass would move away from the downward gravitational pulling force by falling upward. So we can see strong evidence that repulsive or negative gravity is indeed a thing. The question is, can we harness this aspect of gravity or mass in any practical way? In previous videos, we were introduced to the recent discovery that sound waves actually carry gravitational mass. And what's even more astonishing is that this mass is negative. The 2019 article from the Department of Theoretical Physics at Columbia University says that phonons in zero temperature superfluids have an effective coupling to gravity, which depends solely on their energy and on the superfluids equation of state. For ordinary equations of state, 
this coupling respond, corresponds to a negative effective gravitational mass. In the presence of an external gravitational field such as that of the Earth, a phonon's trajectory bends upward. The tiny effective gravitational mass of the phonon generates a tiny gravitational field. The source of this gravitational field travels with the phonon. And because its traveling trajectory is curving upward within an external gravitational field, this means that, in a very real physical sense, the phonon carries negative mass. The article goes on to say that it is important to note that this property or effect is not due to the usual equivalence of mass and energy in relativity. The effect survives in the non-relativistic limit. This refer to, refers to the principle of the theory, theory of relativity in which any form of energy or pressure can generate a gravitational field via the stress energy tensor. But phonons are unique due to the fact that they actually carry mass, not just energy, and that this mass in the generated gravitational field is negative. The researchers also mentioned that this is not a quantum effect. And because it is not a quantum effect, it does not refer to the theorized properties of gravitons, nor their antithesis, antigravitons, both of which are still hypothetical at this point in time. It is also worth mentioning that Phonons do not travel through empty space as true quantum particles such as photons do. Rather, phonons are quasi-quantum particles that only exist within the matter through which they are traveling. These particles travel in a wave-like formation just as photons of light do. So this sound mass effect is apparent even in the classical physics sense and separate from any quantum theory. The article's concluding paragraphs mentions possible scenarios for detecting acoustic negative mass via very large scale phenomena such as seismic events. It specifically equates the energy of a Richter magnitude 9 earthquake of about 10 to the 18th or 1 billion billion joules to a mass of 10 to the 11th or 100 billion kilograms. This will yield a, yield a ratio of 10 million joules for every one kilogram of mass. This energy to mass conversion is colossal, but still smaller than the 90,000 trillion joules to one kilogram that we derived earlier from the equation E equals mc squared. More research will have to be done to determine the reason for such a difference and also to determine if it's unique only to sound. Either way, this revelation, along with the presumed properties of dark energy, points to the very real possibility of negative mass and negative gravity. But now, let's go back to the claims of Dr. Ning Li and Eugene Poklinov and their claims of gravitational shielding or screening. Gravitational shielding is just a, as interesting a concept as repulsive or negative gravity. Perhaps even more so since there has been comparatively few studies and speculations as to its existence and properties beyond the initial experiments of these two researchers. In discussions of the proposed principle, weight loss due to shielding is usually given as a percentage. In Pakletnov's research, the percentage was allegedly up to 2% weight loss of any object placed above the machine. Of course, this is quite small, especially when, especially when considering 2% of, say, a one-pound mass. But all things being equal, if the contraption could be scaled up to megalithic proportions and placed under a 100-ton stone, then the weight loss of the stone would be 2 tons, which would be much more significant in absolute terms, though still quite small relative to the other 98% of the weight that remains. Another interesting property would be the lack of a reactionary force. For instance, if we have a magnetic levitation platform that weighs two pounds and it suspends a disc which weighs two ounces via stabilized magnetic repulsion, then the weight of the entire system is two pounds plus two ounces. 
If we place a 14 ounce weight on top of the disc, then the entire system now weighs three pounds. In other words, the disc and any weight it supports is levitated, levitating in the air, but there's no net weight loss of the system as a whole. The mechanisms within the platform push up on the disc magnet with the needed force to suspend it. This of course results in an equal and opposite force which pushes back down on the platform. This is why magnetic and other forms of levitation are not gravitational modification. Gravitational shielding, however, would definitely be gravity modification. Let's say that we create a device similar to Pachlinov's, which weighs 100 pounds and can shield gravity by 50%. The experimental setup is shown in the figure with the machine under a table-like structure and a 20-pound weight on top of the table. Upon activation of the device, the weight placed above would now weigh only 10 pounds. The entire system should now total 100 plus 10 pounds or 110 pounds rather than 100 pounds plus 20 pounds for 120 total, as would be the case with magnetic levitation. We can certainly see how invaluable such a device would be. A process to greatly, greatly reduce or even eliminate the force of an object due to gravity without that force having to be taken up by another structure would appear to defy one of the most fundamental laws of physics. And as a gravity shield, which could cancel 100%, that would seem otherworldly. But it would bring into question a, a what would happen to an object whose weight has been 100% canceled. Would a huge mass simply be effortless to lift, push, or pull? Or would it levitate? One theory is that it wouldn't levitate unless the percentage exceeds 100%. In this case, we'd probably be talking about negative gravity. We might express this as 110% shielding or G minus 10%, for instance. But another theory is that perhaps it would levitate, particularly near the planet's equator, since we know that the centrifugal force resulting from the Earth's rotation slightly counteracts gravity, with the effect being strongest at the equator. With gravity being canceled out completely, the object with zero weight might simply be pushed away from the surface of the Earth. This concept is similarly echoed in alternative science circles in books, books such as Antigravity and the World Grid, the Antigravity Handbook, both written by author David H. Childress, as well as The Lost Civilization of Lemuria by Frank Joseph. Several passages from these books reflect on gravity as the resultant between two nearly equal forces or effects, one pushing or pulling us towards the Earth's center, and the other pushing us away, with the former slightly stronger than the latter. So theoretically, if we could reduce the Earth-seeking force or effect by some means, vibrationally, magnetically, or otherwise, then perhaps it could be overcome, allowing the centrifugal force from the Earth's spin to literally push us away. We can also imagine this concept with an imaginary water tower with dimensions that are a significant fraction of the Earth's. We know a water tower to be a structure which holds water at a high elevation. This potential energy is a product of height and gravity, which pulls water through the pipes to lower elevations, such as houses and businesses. We could actually envision gravity here as being transformed from a pulling force to a pushing one. A pushing force which could propel water at any angle when the valve is open, even in the opposite direction into the sky. The normal pulling force of gravity basically, basically becomes a negative or repulsive gravity force. The more massive the amount of water, the greater this repulsive gravity force would be. Now, one might say that this is only a different interpretation of a familiar property, but we must remember pressure too can generate gravitational fields via the stress energy tensor as stated before. 
Additionally, this force will be strengthened or aided in regions closer to the equator. Thus, the water would be expected to be propelled even higher out of the holes of pipe, which is directed in the opposite direction of normal Earth gravity, and that this height would be measurably higher at the equator than it would be arising from the very same system at the Earth's poles. But of course, for this to be experimentally evident, the water tower itself would have to be located 6,250 miles away at the poles with the aperture of the 6,215 mile long pipe or holes placed at the equator and directed upwards. This way, the water in the tower would experience full Earth gravity at the poles while the water at the other end of the conduit would experience repulsive gravity plus terrestrial levity. Otherwise, if the tower were also at the equator, then the terrestrial levity acting on the water within it will cancel out any gain in repulsive gravity on the other end. Now, keeping this centrifugal levity concept in mind, there has been the observation that a number of ancient megaliths are relatively close to the equator. Let's also consider that there are some speculative investigators who have pointed to strong evidence that the equator was in a different position in the distant past. Many of us have heard of pole shift events in the Earth's history, but there are different takes on the concept. Alternative theories believe that there were dramatic shifts in the Earth's rotational axis over a very short time, which they contest would have caused worldwide floods and other geological upheavals. Many mainstream scientists, however, deny this, agreeing that there have been pole shifts or polar wanderings of about 30 degrees. But rather than a rapid change, this pole wander has occurred over a very long time, likely resulting in negligible upheaval. Additionally, it has been postulated that there have been accompanying equatorial shifts. This alleged formal equatorial position has been dubbed the Old Equator or the Great Circle. But what's particularly interesting is that many of the ancient megaliths site, uh, megalithic sites seem to be aligned with this older equator, much more than they are aligned with the equator as it is now. These sites include the ancient city of Ur in Sumeria, the Giza Plateau, Easter Island, the ancient Indus Valley settlement of Mahendro, Daro, and even Nazca, among a number of others. Supposedly, fossils of very large animals, including dinosaurs, have also been found along this line. Could the extra levity, which would have been offered along the equator due to geocentrifugal force, have been a key factor in both the growth of significantly larger animals and plants, as seen in some of the fossil record? And would it also have helped in the moving and raising of the blocks used in these great stru uh, structures? As previously mentioned, the combination of the Earth's spin and the equatorial bulge leads to 0.5% less apparent weight at the equator as compared to the poles. 0.5% doesn't seem like a large number, but for a 2,000 ton foundational monolith, this would be 10 tons off its weight if handled, moved, and placed along close proximity to the equator rather than handled at the poles, where it would be even heavier by the weight of about two elephants. Another caveat of this theory is that the cause of the shift, possibly of a, as a cosmic impact, could have also affected the speed of the Earth's rotation, for instance, slowing it down. If this is the case, then it applies a faster Earth rotation in the distant past. And as stated before, a faster rotation would mean an even stronger centrifugal force in a larger equatorial bulge, in turn resulting in even greater levity when moving and lifting weights in proximity to equatorial regions. Is it not also interesting that modern rocket launches also take place in areas near the equator in order to take advantage of increased terrestrial levity? In taking it a step further, how might these principles relate to the illusions of sonic levitation of stones in antiquity? 
Levity at the equator increases with greater spin and centrifugal force. But what about vibrations? Is there any evidence that vibrations can induce levity in a test mass? For this, let's look at the description of acoustic lubrication. In acoustic lubrication, sound permits vibrations to cause an actual separation between two sliding surfaces, rendering a temporary state of significantly lower friction in the system, especially at resonance. Sound vibrations then actually do reduce the apparent weight of a heavy object, although this reduction is only cyclical and would not typically read out on a scale. Instead, the reduction in the friction, friction coefficient and much easier movement is demonstrated by the greatly reduced force needed to move the mass. And so the question is, could the cyclical levity energy of certain frequencies of sonic vibrations be combined with the rotational levity effect of planetary spin in order to create a practical system of apparent weight reduction? And if so, then how would these frequencies relate to the rotational speed? It's worthy to mention that a similar combination of reduced gravity and sound is employed on a small scale in space-based containerless processing. In the, in the microgravity of the space shuttle, much less acoustic energy is required to levitate small objects. Incredibly, the technique can be precise enough to be employed in the touch-free building of small model bridges and other miniature structures as we can see here. We can clearly imagine how useful this technique would be on a megalithic scale as it would render cranes and other heavy lifting equipment obsolete. If employed aboard the space shuttle or space station, the reduced gravity condition will be realized through the weightlessness of free fall rather than terrestrial centrifugal force but the basic principle is the same. Also, hearkening back to the work of John Warrell Keeley described in previous videos, he describes his method of levitation or what he called aerial suspension as the result of two forces, namely terrestrial propulsion and celestial attraction. Gravity, by contrast, was due to terrestrial attraction and celestial propulsion with sound vibrations being a medium of control between these opposing levity and traction forces. It would seem that the Earth's centrifugal push then would be the terrestrial propulsive property, or at least one manifestation of it. But what about celestial attraction? Does this somewhat cryptic term of Keeley's point to the effects of celestial bodies? Do certain celestial alignments en enhance levity effects on Earth, similar to the effect of the moon on the tides, and also combining with the acoustic and centrifugal terrestrial levity in order to reduce apparent weight? If this is the case, then it follows that the effect will be stronger at certain times than at others, just as when sending the ro a rocket up during certain launch windows as this allows modern NASA engineers to maximize the use of terrestrial levity as mentioned. And if such is the case, then it leaves much to ponder regarding not only the effects of ancient astronomical alignments and events on the planet in general, but also the ancients' vast knowledge of them and of the Earth itself. But as incredible as the full realization of an ancient acoustic terrestrial levitation technique would be, it might be matched and even superseded by a modern technology involving partial or total gravitational shielding. The hypothetical shielding setup shown in the figure here, or one similar, would be invaluable, particularly in easing the vertical movement of heavy masses. And if Dr. Ning Li is correct in that the neutralization field would extend even into space, then we can easily imagine just how this would completely revolutionize the space in industry in terms of drastically reducing the energy needed for launching spacecrafts. In, bu in building the gravity, uh, gravity shield launching device at or near the equator would allow the Earth's spin to aid in the process, 
reducing the energy even further or enabling much heavier masses to be launched with the same amount of energy and effort. But what about a moving vehicle? Well, in this case, anti-gravity in the form of gravi gravitic repulsion rather than gravity shielding might be the better of the two techniques. If it is possible to generate a gravity field to interact with and repel a planet's gravitational field, then we might be able to achieve gravitic dy dynamic suspension. Being able to generate an artificial gravity field would be invaluable not only for propulsion, but also to generate gravity on board spacecrafts and space stations. An additional question here would be, would this artificial gravity field offer protection from the effects of acceleration and inertia? Some UFOologists have cited this principle as the reason why UFOs can make such sharp turns at high speeds, as well as to accelerate and decelerate so quickly and not kill the pilots or even damage the structure of the craft itself. Otis T. Carr claimed the same concerning his circular foil spacecraft. The idea is that the craft with its own gravity field will become independent of that of the Earth. Thus the occupants would be subject only to the craft's field rather than the Earth for as long as the artificial gravity, gravity field is in operation. But by what principle would this work? And is it something that we could test within the limited confines of current gravitational technology? Let's think back to the equivalence principle once again. In outer space, a person inside of a rocket in, in space accelerating at a magnitude of 9.8 meters per second squared will feel a force or effect indistinguishable from gravity on Earth. But what if the rocket is still on Earth and headed into the sky? Since acceleration is a vector, we can add and subtract acceleration vectors to each other. This means that the 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration of the rocket should add directly to the 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration of the Earth. But more interestingly, what would happen if the rocket were turned 180 degrees and accelerated towards the Earth at a value of 19.6 meters per second squared, or twice the acceleration of normal gravity? The occupants of the rocket should now be able to stand in a way which will be considered upside down from our frame of reference on the ground with their heads oriented towards the earth far below. In this case, the occupants become subject to the greater gravitational acceleration produced by the rocket and would seemingly overcome the acceleration of Earth's gravity to pull them down to the rocket's nose. With this, the total acceleration would then be 19.6 minus 9.8 meters per second squared, thus giving the feeling of normal gravity aboard, aboard the rocket, but again acting in the opposite direction. So could acceleration vector interactions help us to gain insight into how the artificial gravity fields of UFOs interact with external gravity fields in order to protect its occupants from the inertial effects of rapid acceleration and deceleration? We could think of the Earth as, as a type of spacecraft. It is round, it has a gravitational field, and it travels in space at tremendous speed around the sun at about 66,700 miles per hour to be exact. Yet we don't, we don't feel like we're moving because the speed is constant. But what if the speed were increased or decreased all of a sudden? Or what if the entire solar system took a sharp turn in space Will we feel the effects on Earth? It seems that it would depend on how extreme the rate of change was. Since acceleration and deceleration vectors can be added to each other or subtracted, it seems that we might be protected provided the Earth's gravity were strong enough in comparison to the changes. The more dramatic the changes, the stronger terrestrial gravity will have to be in order to protect us. But UFOs have been clocked at being able to not only accelerate from a hover to thousands of miles per hour in only seconds, but also being able to make sharp turns 
at 90 degrees while traveling at speeds up to 13,000 miles per hour. And so the ultimate question is, how strong would a craft's gravitational field have to be in order to counter these inertial effects? Some have speculated instead that UFOs are piloted remotely as super advanced drones, or even piloted by androids. These seem like reasonable speculations. But what about the structures of the crafts themselves? How do they and the electronic equipment that they house keep from being ripped apart by such titanic forces? Could artificial gravity vector fields generated by the crafts be the more likely scenario? Vector fields which could interact and offset these changes, just as theorized by the aforementioned rocket thought experiment. Inertial dampening is the hypothetical principle used in sci-fi to explain protection from the extreme inertial and acceleration forces. But these rocket thought experiments could at least help us to begin to form a, a real world basis for the same principle. Another way to think about this is with the Earth's rotation thought experiment. As mentioned before, if the ground speed of the Earth at the equator were to increase to about 16,000 miles per hour, then anything not held down would float above the surface in low Earth orbit due to its centrifugal force. However, if gravity as the countering centripetal force were to simultaneously increase in direct proportion, then the weight and position of objects would not change at all. In fact, outside of possible weather impacts, Probably the only thing that we would notice is that the days and nights were shorter. Gravity would be a vector counteracting the centrifugal pseudo antigravity vector. Now to better understand how this concept might apply to high speed spacecrafts, let's say that we have a person aboard a flying saucer, which suddenly moves upward at an acceleration equal to 100 times Earth gravity or 100 G. This is about 20 times higher than the average human being can withstand for even a few seconds and about 10 times higher than a trained fighter pilot can survive. If we were to use the counter gravity principle just described with the rockets, then the craft would have to generate a gravity vector in the opposite direction with a magnitude of at least 97 to 99 G in order to counter the effects of acceleration, which would otherwise instantly crush the occupant into a pancake. The basic principle seems to be sound, but there's still the nagging question of the control scheme for such a critical system. Would a fixed artificial gravity field be somehow able to automatically counter the effects of any magnitude of acceleration without any electronic intervention? Or would there need to be an extremely advanced control system which would have to have the ability to anticipate the movements and respond with the needed counter gravity? making this decision between sensing and responding in the quickest fraction of a second. These will be the pertinent issues, issues which will become even more critical with the complexities of free flight. As UFOs have been seen to zigzag and accelerate in any direction and not just vertically or horizontally. Therefore, more complex experiments will have to be devised in order to understand the complex interactions of the many different acceleration vector orientations which can occur during free flight. Needless to say, these will make for some very fascinating experiments. There will be additional issues concerning artificial gravitational generation. For instance, we know that a magnet dragged over a container filled with iron filings will attract and accumulate the filings in any other small metallic debris. A maglev vehicle will likely also accumulate a lot of metallic debris while it's in operation. If, if enough loose metallic material were accumulated, it could severely impede movement. We can imagine then that a vehicle with a gravitational propulsion system might have similar issues, but even more so since it would accumulate the debris of all compositions. Though the craft would gravitationally repel the Earth's gravity field, it would likely also gravitationally attract any loose debris 
that is in close proximity to the craft. And so effective techniques will have to be devised in order to mitigate or handle this issue. Conditions that will cause a sudden change in the induced operating fields will be an issue as well. For instance, if a maglev device were to pass over a part of the non-ferrous track, which was thinner, the reflected field would suddenly lose strength, resulting in a corresponding loss of levitation height and carrying capacity. Another example is if the metal pieces are attached to the ground. In this case, the suspension will be completely lost and the maglev lift will be pulled down. This could be potentially catastrophic. A levitation de device based on gravitational repulsion might be similarly affected by well-known variations in the planet's surface gravity, some of which are caused by variations in mass concentrations under the Earth's surface. A sophisticated control system would need to be employed to be able to predict and correct for these variations of magnetic or gravitational repulsion strength in order to operate smoothly. Additionally, what effect would such a device have on the environment? A moving gravity device would probably generate gravitational eddies and accompanying vibrations over the structures which it travels, as well as in any nearby structural masses. This would be a serious problem in the case where the generated vibrations match the resonant frequencies of those structures. This would be especially problematic if the eddies were actually necessary for the gravitic lift. But what would occur? But this would occur even in a maglev system, as a magnetic device moving over a non-ferrous metal track would likewise generate resonances from the time-varying repulsive magnetic forces. An advantage that the gravitational diversion would have in this regard is that it would not also generate electrical eddies like the maglev would. Either way, for such repulsive systems, whether electromagnetic or gravitic, great care will have to be taken to include effective vibration dampening in the design of the surrounding structures in order to protect them from the destructive resonances. But there's still another piece to the puzzle of gravity, and that piece seems to involve time itself or rather gravity as a function of time. All objects move through space-time, but depending on adjacent external influences, such as a large mass or energy potential, time for that object can travel at different rates over its surface. And because of this, a temporal differences, the difference between particles closer to a large mass and those farther from it emerges no matter how seemingly infinitesimal this difference is. Just as we know that time for a person in the vicinity of a black hole will be much slower than it would be for a person farther away, say on the Earth. We understand this property as time dilation. Time dilation is the difference in elapsed time due to either a relative velocity between them, which is described by special relativity, or due to a difference in gravitational potential between their locations, which is described by general relativity. If we consider any object of a given mass that comes within proximity of another mass, it will also be a part of that object that is closer to the mass and a part that is farther away. This is true no matter how small or flat that object may be. Now with this in mind, if we envision this same small mass traveling closer to a much larger body such as a planet or moon, the particles of the object that are closer to that celestial body will travel at a slower rate than the particles in that part of the object that is farther away. Hence there will be a small temporal gradient over the object's length, or height. As we see in the animation, this will result in the object falling towards that celestial mass. This is known now as gravitational time dilation, which is an actual difference of elapsed time between two events as measured by observers situated at varying distances from a gravitational mass. And it is this gravitational time dilation which causes objects to fall towards a large mass. This model seems to be gaining some acceptance 
as so far preliminary experiments with particles seem to verify it. But what would this mean for achieving anti-gravity? Well, a temporal difference over an object shall also mean a corresponding difference over that object's particular vibrational signature. This is described as gravitational redshift, in which the closer a frequency emitting body is to a gravitating body, the more its time is slowed by gravitational time dilation, and thus the more the frequency observed will become lower or redshifted. If the frequencies emitted are light frequencies, then the higher frequency light, blue light for instance, will be observed as lower frequency light, such as red light, hence the term redshifted. So theoretically, if we could alter the frequency of an object, such as to lessen or eliminate that dilation, we might be able to stop the object from falling towards a planetary mass, resulting in a lessening of gravitational weight or even flotation. Altering it further still may even cause it to fall upwards. This frequency alteration, if possible, should be achievable via the medium of using electromagnetism, light, or even sound. The notion of frequencies of sound harken back to the earlier discussion of negative mass and gravity that sound waves carry. The implications are staggering as it suggests that sound via the medium of gravity can affect time itself and vice versa. And so we might further wonder if artificial gravity feels strong enough to levitate heavy objects or to generate enough gravity to mimic the gravity of Earth aboard a spaceship will have similar effects on local time. And if so, then how would these effects manifest? And would they be negligible or problematic? So we know that definitely that mass, pressure, and energy can generate gravity. But why do this affect the fabric of space-time or the stress-energy tensor? This theory of gravitational time dilation might give us a potential answer to this question. Is it possible that time may be the ultimate answer to all of this? At the very least, it certainly hits home the fact that time is not some fixed and unchangeable medium of reference, but is instead a dynamic one which can exert and transmit its own effects and even give rise to one of the most basic and ubiquitous forces in the universe, gravity. And if such is the case, then time itself might be the missing link and will be the key to the unified fields. Such advanced understanding of all these principles will greatly supersede our current and very limited gravitational technology, which so far includes acceleration, freefall, and the centrifuge. With our present technology, the most practical way to mimic anti-gravity for a vehicle or moving object is magnetic levitation, electrodynamic suspension in particular. This type of magnetic levitation uses Lenz's law to produce levitation via magnetic repulsion instead of magnetic attraction. With this principle, we can employ it to reduce gravitational weight of an object or to make it float completely. In the experiment here, I have a three and a half inch diameter flux coil attached to the underside of a concrete block and resting on in an aluminum slab. Using only a couple of fingers, it is very difficult to even budge the block. Ac activating the coil doesn't levitate the block as the block is too heavy, but it does make lifting it in the same manner much easier, effectively mimicking weight reduction. It is an interesting sensation to be able to easily move something that your eyes are telling you is quite heavy. We can imagine a gravitational device enabling something very similar. As we can see, the effect only works over a small distance, and so we wouldn't be able to lift it very high as the levity reduces with distance from the aluminum plate. If the gravitational device was based on repulsive gravity, we might expect it to operate in a similar manner with an effective lift range of only a short distance above the ground.
but if the device were based on gravitational shielding, then the range of effect might be practically unlimited, allowing the mass it is attached to to be lifted and held aloft at any height. This is because, this is because the shielding beam would extend even into space, at least according to Dr. Ning Li. As we can see, by studying full-scale magnetic levitation devices, we might gain additional insights into the possible effects of actual anti-gravity or gravitational suspension should we attain it. These insights would include energetic needs as well as environmental effects such as unwanted eddies and resonances in nearby objects and structures. We can certainly achieve wonders with our current level of electromagnetic technology. If we could ever gain the same level of understanding and control over gravity as we have of electromagnetism, then this would completely revolutionize technology for centuries to come, to say the least. Many of the forces and effects we've come to understand are polarized and have an antithesis. Positive and negative charges, pressure and vacuum, South Pole and North Pole, even the Casimir force, which was always seen as an attractive force, can become repulsive using metal materials. Can the same be said of gravity? Will we one day be able to reverse it or turn it on and off with a switch? To have another one of the fundamental universal forces at our fingertips, we will have to become truly advanced, not just technologically, but also existentially. Indeed, with great power comes great responsibility. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay tuned.